Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Just in case we've not met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here once again. Thank you so much for choosing to come out and worship with us today. I'd like to reiterate what uh, was said a little bit earlier there and what was talking about last week. Uh, Next week is Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. That's going to be an amazing weekend. And, uh, you know, last week, Pastor Adam talked about evangelism and the importance of it and the fact that it's not just the pastors who evangelize, it's really all of our roles to go out there and share the good news of the gospel. And one of the easiest things that you could do is simply invite somebody to church. And I want to encourage you this week, you know, everybody bring one. I know that we have a lot of little slogans around here, but everybody bring one. Don't come alone to church next week. Would you, um, I pray that God would put it on our hearts, just the weight of what weighs in the balance. Heaven and hell weighs in the balance, right? And seeing people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior is the most important thing that we could do as individuals, as a church, introducing them to our God and King. So I pray this week you will be very intentional about reaching out to some people in your sphere of influence and encouraging the them to come with you. Also, just from a practical sense, try to get here a little bit early. Usually that day is overflowing, right? That day is one of the days that's overflowing. If you could, get here early, get your seats, be ready, and bring somebody with you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. So today's the day that we celebrate in Christianity the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And really today I want to put a spin on it by talking about the triumphal entry of Jesus into your heart. And ultimately, just as that song we sang earlier, how that changes everything in our lives by allowing us to gloriously reflect the image of God to everyone that we encounter. Why don't we go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory today. How awesome it is to come into your house and worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we ask you, O Lord, that today you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. Father, as we speak on this topic of what it means to be genuine as a church and what it means to be genuine as God's people, Lord, could we see you, O Lord, the way, the truth and the life. And would we acknowledge that nobody comes to the Father except through you, Lord God. Would we be those that follow that narrow path, O Lord, that we would focus our eyes on you, that we wouldn't get distracted, that we wouldn't look to the left or the right, but we would go forward seeking the prize that is you, our Lord and Savior, our King Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Are you all ready to get into God's word today? Are you sure you're ready to get into God's word today? You don't really sound like it. So today we're going to speak on this value of being genuine. So I wasn't trying to drum up some fake enthusiasm there. I hope that you come really seeking to have God's word penetrate your hearts when you come here and worship with us at Journey Church. So as with most of the values we've been sharing, there's a corporate aspect to this one as well as a personal aspect. And if you're joining us for the first time today, uh, we're really at the conclusion of a series on our church culture and values. I would encourage you to go back and watch some of the messages that you might have missed. You know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast, check it out. And if you're new to the church, also we're going to be doing our growth track starting in the month of May. So sign up for that, become a part of it, plug in, get involved, use your God-given gifts to make a difference in the lives of others. So I want to share the value as we have it written. Real people, so I want you to repeat this after me. We are real not religious people. We don't hide behind a mask or image. We fall short at times. Do we need to read that one again? We fall short at times and we aren't afraid to admit our shortcomings to one another and build one another up. Amen. Y'all did very good with that one. So I've often said around here that if you hang around long enough, I am guaranteed to disappoint you, right? It's going to happen, right? We as human beings, there's going to become those moments in life when we disappoint one another. But as one pastor told me, it's important to fess up quickly when we mess up, right? To keep short accounts, to 
And that's part of what the essence of this is all about. So um, we live in a world today where I believe it's hard to discern truth from facts. I mean, maybe um, it was popularized by our politicians not long ago where they'd say fake news, right? And then it became fake almost everything, right? Everything in the world seems fake. You don't know what to believe when you watch mainstream media and you try to discern what the truth really is. But the word of God says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, right? I think there is one barometer that we could put our hope and our trust in, and that's Jesus and the word of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We live in a world where our online personas are so filtered and touched up that if you meet somebody in real life, you don't even know that you really met them. Are you like, is that really you? I mean, I'm not so certain that that's the you that I saw when I saw you online. But where did this value genuine originate for us as a church? I'll talk corporately, then personally. You all know I love my taglines around here. Real, relevant, and enjoyable is how we really phrase this one out. To be genuine for us meant we wanted to be real, we wanted to be relevant, we wanted to be enjoyable as a church. And I've always felt that it's an imperative that we live out the values as leaders that we're asking the people of Journey Church to live out. It's just how we've attempted to live our lives. So what does it mean to be real from the pulpit? I've always strived to be the same person that I am on stage as I am in life. Have I made mistakes in that along the way? Yes, but that's been my goal. If you see me out at Publix, if you see me out at Carabas, if you see me out at work, if you see me wherever you find me, you're going to meet pretty much the same exact Eric that you see here on stage. God has used my many shortcomings and our family's many shortcomings to help people relate. I or my family has never tried to act holier than thou, to be set apart in some weird or strange way. We're real people with real issues, with real challenges, and God has allowed those challenges to help people along the way. Thanks be to God, right? Oftentimes they've been icebreakers to kind of break the ice and let people um, put their guards down and begin to share with us something a little bit more real, to take their masks off, even if for a few moments so that we could get real about our life. There were two churches that I was part of that really framed it up for me corporately, and they had two very different themes. Someone said to me this morning, I'm just hanging in there. And sadly, that was the theme of that church. It seemed, right? How many of you want to go to that church? Come on, Jesus. Everybody you'd ask, you'd be like, how are you doing today? And they'd be like, I'm just hanging in there. And back then, God gave me this vision of like a monkey hanging from a tree. I'm just hanging in there. I'm barely making it, right? And then for another season, we went to this church where the theme was ending every single service had to be a hip, hip, hooray. Everything's good. Everything's perfect. Everything's fine all the time. How many of you experienced that in life, right? Not too many, right? So I I came to believe that the truth lied somewhere in the middle, right? That, man, there's those days that life should be those hip, hip, hoorays. There's those other days where I'm just barely hanging in there. But if you're just barely hanging in there as a believer for a really long time, there's a problem. You need to get real about that. We need to maybe take some action. You need to get some help. You need to talk about that and get some other people in your life who could be an encouragement to you because I honestly think the life of a Christian, once we're transformed, if we believe the song that we sang earlier that God changes everything, that one of the characteristics of our life should be joy, right? There should be joy and peace and the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in our lives. Those are characteristics that we've been touched by Jesus, that we've encountered him, that he's changing our life. Now, I realize not all moments in life are that way, right? That's where the genuineness comes in. There's those moments where, man, life is just hard. And some of you might find yourself at that place today, and it's okay. But guess what? The Scripture tells us that there's a time and a season for all things, right? Right? That we're going to go through all these normal emotions in life, and that's what it means to be genuine. When you're suffering and when you're struggling, you sometimes need to fake it till you make it, is one of my wife's sayings, right? But you can't do that all the time, right? So you get what I'm saying, right? You can relate to what I'm talking about here today. Ecclesiastes 3.1, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under the sun. So to be genuine means walking through all those emotions and as a church, ultimately helping people look more like Jesus in them. What does it mean to be relevant? 
that we do talk about the issues of the day. We won't avoid the issues of the day, even if they're difficult issues, but we don't overemphasize them, especially where things like politics or opinion can easily get involved, right? Because guess what? Everybody has an opinion, right? We all have opinions. I don't really care about opinions. I care about what God's word says, right? Not only about the big picture things in life, but as you'll see in just a moment when we turn it around to personally, it's more important to understand who God says you are and know who you are and who, whose you are than anything else in life. Amen, right? So that's where we're going to head in just a second. So what does that mean in terms of our teaching? Um, we try to preach not just for information, but ultimately for life transformation. The gospel is about life transformation, about being transformed from glory to glory. How have we historically fleshed that out in our teaching? Um, we tried to balance a couple things. What, if you look back at the history of Journey Church, some of the things that you would see is that typically during the course of one year, we would do what's called expository teaching. We would go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through certain books of the Bible. I believe that's important, and, and I believe that trend should continue here as we continue to move into the future because what that allows you to do is not cherry-pick the Bible, right? So the other kind of teaching that we do, and we usually alternate year after year, so we do expository teaching typically for a year, and then we do topical teaching for the course of another year. So topical teaching is where you could pick out certain aspects and you really believe God's calling um, to some kind of an issue within the church and you want to focus in on that. It might be a marriage series. It might be um, a series on our health and healing, spirit, soul, and body, whatever that might be, right? And we zone in on those kinds of things. So the balance of those two can be a very great thing because if you only do topical teaching, the tendency is that you forget about dealing with some of the difficult things in the Bible that you would encounter when you do verse by verse teaching, right? There's some verses that you hit when you do verse by verse that you're like, man, I wish I didn't have to preach that one that day. But those are the ones that we need to hear, right? And God has a way of bringing those to us in that particular season. There's those other moments where, man, those topical series, like the one we've just gone through on church cultures and values is really important to get into the life of the church, to take us from where we're at to where God wants us to be. So we've always tried to balance those two extremes. So I hope you've learned a little bit more about who we are as a church during the course of this series, and maybe it's made you all the more enthusiastic about continuing on, being a part of what God's doing here and advancing the gospel in our area and beyond. Can I get an amen to that one? Enjoyable. I think Pastor Adam said it earlier this year and repeated it last week. Um, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. So joy, as I said earlier, should be one of the characteristics of the life of a believer. We're not called to be woe is me Christians. Take that into the context of what Adam talked about evangelistically. If you're walking around like Linus in the peanuts all the time, right? Y'all remember Linus? Linus was like, woe is me, everything's terrible, everything's bad, I'm just hanging in there all the time. How much good evangelism do you see in that? It's going to be difficult, right? There's a saying um, in AA, it says, if you want what we have, you will go to any length to get it. One person clapped their hand. <laughs> But, you know, people have often asked me, what's your motto in evangelism? And I'll steal it from AA because I think it applies to Christianity. If you want what we have, you will go to any length to get it. If people see Jesus alive in you, if there's something different about you that's so attractive because Jesus is attractive, let me tell you, when they see him flowing and functioning by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's irresistible to the world around you. It will do one of two things. It will repel some who aren't ready for the gospel, and others will just be like, tell me what is different about your life. Tell me what's different about your life. And to do that, we have to understand who we are and whose we are. Let's begin to shift gears and talk about personally. Let's go back to our value statement and build from there. We are real. We're not a religious people. We don't hide behind a mask or an image. We fall short at times and we aren't afraid to admit our shortcomings to one another and build each other up to encourage one another, to be there for one another. To me, the essence of that statement really has to do with our identity. 
Who are we? Who are you? Fundamentally, you have to answer that question. Also tied to it, as I said earlier, is whose are you? Knowing who you are and whose you are makes up the nature of who our identity is. Let's see who God says that we are. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Every human being, whether saved or unsaved is an image bearer of God. Some reflect his image very beautifully and others don't, right? Till they're saved, right? When you get to the nature of talking about we live in a world that is in spiritual war, right? Why does Satan try so intently to go after the things that make up our identity? What do I mean in that? Um, take an issue like fatherlessness, right? Why does he want us to be a people who are fatherless so that we can't connect to God the Father because our earthly father has disappointed us, has left us, has not given us an example, right? Why do we see such a push in modern day society right now to go after issues like gender identity? Because it says in Genesis 126, you are created male and female. Male and female, you are created. So to add confusion where the argument starts to become, are you a he or a she or a them or a they? Do you see where the devil gets into the middle of that, trying to confuse the issue? He's trying to get to the very nature of who we are. And then you get to the issue of marriage, right? It comes into there, he, you know, one man and one woman get married, right? And it reflects the image of God, the Trinitarian image of God with God at the center of their relationship and male and female, he created them. So he attacks family. He attacks the nature of marriage. He attacks the very nature of who we are at the core. This is part of a demonic strategy in our generation to let us not reflect God's image. He hates you because you are an image bearer of God. That's why he's doing the things that he's doing in our generation. Do you see why it's such an important imperative that we hold to these core values that make us who we are in Christ? Because to reflect Christ's image means that we believe in the things that are said in God's word, right? So we can expect, remember when I talked about know thine enemy for those of you who are here about a year ago when we were going through that spiritual series? We got to understand his attacks and why he's doing them the way that he's doing because he's trying to get Christians to not understand who you are because if you don't understand who you are, then guess what? You're not going to understand whose you are or you're going to reject it, right? So he's trying to keep us from the truth. Does that all make sense to you today? So let's go on and say, God hates us, or not God hates us, thank you, Jesus. The devil hates us because of the very fact, I'm trying to get back on track here, come on. I'm being genuine with you. I lost track for a moment. He hates us because of the very fact that we are created in the image of God. That means all of life has value. That means God doesn't create any junk, amen? Now, in the greater story of God, creation, fall, rescue, restoration, we cannot deny the effects of our fallen nature. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin leads to shame. Sin leads to death. In our fallen nature, we even as Christians have an identity crisis that we need to get through to remember whose we are and who we are. How is it often manifested? As our statement said, it's manifested through mask wearing. Instead of being genuine, we try to project a different image to the world than who we really are. Social media is a prime example of this. We post all of our wins and we rarely post our losses, right? Some of us go the opposite direction and post all of our losses with the hope that we're going to get sympathy for others. But sadly, if I would share this with you, that does nothing but turn people off all the more. We need to be genuine. We need to reflect who we are. 
We use filters and touch up our images to make sure we represent the best image of ourselves to the world. In business settings, I've seen people drop names and try to act bigger than they really are, all to try to prove a point that they're better than somebody else or to garner some level of importance. Some do this by adorning themselves with things, the right clothes, the right car, the right house. Others seek to do it through their amazing physique and outstanding intellect or good looks. Come on, Jesus. I don't fall under that category. Hallelujah. Jesus. Others in our generation, especially those in Hollywood, it seems, and it's, it's trending into the real world. Have you seen what people are doing with plastic surgery? I mean, almost becoming like, you know, non-human. They look like aliens when they take it too far. Does anybody agree with me with what they're seeing out there right now? It's gotten really strange. Holy cow, help me, Lord. At the root of it, we puff ourselves up and we often do so at the expense of others. We're better than somebody else. But the Bible says this, it's important to remember. Romans 3.3, 3, for I say, through the grace that is given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think of himself soberly as God has dealt with each one as a measure of faith. Don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself. Yet all the while, those things always come up lacking and putting our hope and finding in our identity in anything other than Jesus will ultimately fail us. Guess what? Our looks will fade away with age, sometimes also with our minds. Money comes and goes. If your identity is in your work, guess what? You are replaceable. When you're gone, somebody will fill your slot the following week. There's a hole in our hearts that can only be filled through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. God sent his son to die that we might have life and be welcomed back into his family. He made that triumphal trip into Jerusalem on this day and ultimately to the cross to rescue us from the very grips of death. He wants to restore us. This process is known as sanctification. It restores us to Christ's likeness so that we could better reflect the image of God to a lost and hurting world that surrounds us. Jesus accepts people right where they are, but he loves us enough to not leave us where we are. Do you get that one? He loves you enough to accept you where you are, but he loves you enough that he won't leave you where you are. Church, we have to be real It's time to take our masks off. It's time to look in the mirror to see ourselves as who we really are, to accept it, then ask God to change us where he needs to change us so that we would look more like him. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of God are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I've noticed in a lot of these self-help workout type plans, one of the things that they do at the beginning is they say, you got to kind of get in some clothes that show your body as it really is, and you got to take a picture of yourself. And oftentimes, the journey to health and the natural ends right there, right? We're like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to go take my picture. I'm not going to look at who I am rightly. But spiritually, we kind of need to do the same thing, right? What that, what that particular scripture is intimating is that we need to go take that look in the mirror and see ourselves as who we are. And if there are things in our life that don't line up with God's word, then guess what? God will help us if we'll ask him. If you say, God, will you transform me as your word says from glory to glory? I don't like this aspect of who I am. And I've tried to overcome it myself before, and I seemingly just don't have the strength in my own power to do that. Lord, would you help me? I assure you, if you come to him with that kind of spirit, he will help you transform from glory to glory that you would better reflect his image. Can I get an amen to that one? See, I'm not who I was, nor where I want to be. I'm right where God has me right now. But man, I want to change to look more like him. And how do I do that? By fixing my eyes on Jesus, by spending more time in his presence. The more time I spend with him and others who are like him, I begin to act like him. I begin to talk like him. I begin to live like him. And that's who I want to be. 
Paul says, in me there is nothing, there's junk. Anything that I create in and of myself is but rubbish. Only things that will last are the things that are in me that are of Christ. So I need to reflect. In AA, I've referred to it a couple times, and uh, to those who struggle with recovery, man, I, I, um, I tell you, just keep pressing in, keep seeking God, keep doing the steps, keep allowing God to work in your life. I think those steps are applicable to many other areas of life, and one of them is called the fourth step. After um, admitting that God is your only path to salvation, right, you come to a point where they challenge you to examine yourself rightly, to go look at your life and take a fearless and searching moral inventory of yourself. If any of you have ever gone through that, it is not a pleasant experience because you look at yourself and you look at all the things that you did in the midst of your addiction and in life and you like, did I really do that? <laughs> Did I really say that? Did I really hurt that person in that way? And for a moment, you're like, man, I am a horrible person and I am unredeemable and there is nothing in me that is of good. But it says that if you'll confess your sins to God, and then they suggest also to another human being to kind of cement it in there that you are brave enough to go there and share it with somebody else, then guess what? God can begin that process of change in your life. So if you do anything today, I ask you to maybe to take that first step and look in the mirror and say, Lord, where am I at right now? Maybe I'm not who I want to be, but for many of you, one of the wins is you're not who you used to be, right? You're changing, you're transforming, so don't beat yourself up over it if you find yourself lacking, but allow him to continue to change. You say, God, I am willing to submit to that process. I am willing to change because I want to reflect your glory. Let me share with you just a few verses before we close about what God says about you, about who you are and about this process of sanctification. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't let people hold it over you, the old you, right? It might linger a little bit. There might be challenges, but that's not you anymore. I am no longer an addict. I am no longer a drug person, right? I am no longer an alcoholic. I was those things. It's part of my story. It's part of who I was, but I am no longer those things. In Christ, I am a new creation, as are you, right? You're no longer defined. They make a part of who you are, but your identity, my identity is no longer that of an alcoholic. Does that make sense? My identity is now found in Christ. I'm a grateful, recovered alcoholic. It's part of my story, right? But I'm no longer identified as that. Colossians 3.10. I have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You're being transformed daily by the power of the living God. And guess what? You don't have to make those changes all by yourself. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Man, there was a time and a season where I was low for a long time. And I would stand on that verse. Jesus, it says, he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. And that was all I could hold my head on for that period of time. Lord, will you come through? Will you deliver on that promise? Because I've been trying and I sure can't do it on my own. And guess what? He came through for me and he will do it for you. He can change you. He can transform you. Here's one of my favorite. In Christ, we could take off our masks, be who God created us to be, to bear his image to the world. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Workmanship might not be the best translation. It says, you are God's masterpiece. That's how God sees you. As we close, I'd ask you, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Maybe your earthly father disappointed you, but I'm here to tell you your heavenly father will never leave you, will never forsake you. 
just as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, I pray that if you've never surrendered your heart to him, that today you would allow him to ride triumphantly into your heart. Maybe you are a believer, but you're still struggling with your identity. You're still struggling with some of the issues that we talked about today. You're still identifying as something that may be sinful. There's some things in your life, some character defects, some challenges that you're experiencing that you don't want to continue going on. And I want to pray for you today about that, that you'd receive a breakthrough right here today before you'd leave. Would you rise with me out of your seats? Let's pray. Lord, this Palm Sunday, would we be reminded of whose we are so that we can become who we are in you? Lord, some of us are walking around identifying ourselves as our old lives or by some sinful behaviors, and we think of ourselves as not enough. The truth is we are not enough, that we will never be enough, that you are enough. So, Lord, if there be people in this very room that have never surrendered their life to you, I pray this very day that they would lay their identities at their feet, that they would lay their sins at their feet, and that they would turn their lives over to you as their Lord and Savior. But still others, I suspect that many in this room are believers in Jesus Christ. Yet they've heard the words that I've shared today and their life might not be characterized by joy or by the gifts of the Spirit or by the fruits of the Spirit. I would ask you to take a moment and ask God to examine your heart. What areas is he bringing to your mind? What areas is he bringing to your attention? If he's brought something to your attention, would you do me a favor? You don't have to say what it is. Would you just raise your hand up high if there's some things in your life that you know he wants you to change? If that's you, would you raise your hand up high? For the rest of you, it's pride. It's okay. I'm I'm being light at that. But if you raise your hand, Lord, for those who have raised their hand, maybe some who are saying, Jesus, I need you for the very first time. For yet others acknowledging some sin, some challenges, some identity crisis in their life, some areas that they haven't fully surrendered to you that they're wanting to hold on to or cling on to. Lord, I join with them and I ask you, O oh Lord, that you would fulfill your word, that you would do the work in their heart, that heart surgery on them to transform them from glory to glory. Lord, they've done the job of coming up and looking in the mirror and judging themselves rightly in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you, O Lord, today to do that which only you could do. That, Father, you would change our hearts, that you would take our whole old hardened hearts and transform them into hearts of flesh, that we would truly acknowledge that we are a new creation in you, that we could walk genuinely reflecting who we are. Yes, some days that's a moment where we're just hanging in there. Some days where we're ultimately filled with joy. But Lord, that we would be genuine and not be a fake people, that we would be a real people who really put our hope and our trust in you and you alone. So I'd ask you, maybe you're going to pray this for the first time or maybe as a way of rededication and a reminder that you would just say along with me in your hearts and your minds that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that I might have life, that my sins might be forgiven, that I might be part of your family forevermore. And God, you are God the Father in whom I can trust, put my hope in, my trust in, that you love me, that you sent your son to die, that I might become part of the family and that you promised that as I surrendered my life to you, you would take all this emptiness, all this pain, all this shame, all the things that hide me from being who I really am. I take my mask off. I lay it at your feet. You promised that you would fill those empty spaces with the power of the Holy Spirit that you would send the Holy Spirit alongside to guide us, to direct us, to lead us to truth, to lead us to life, that we could be the kind of people that you created us to be, that we could be the image bearers that you want us to be, that we would accurately reflect your image. So Lord, I pray that you would release that right now and fill the hearts and minds of the people that are in this room 
that we would walk from this place in your glory, that we would reflect your image, that we would embody all the values that we've been talking about for all these weeks this year, Lord God, that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as ourselves. And that even this very week as we reflect on what happened between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, that, Lord, we would be about seeking and saving the lost, that we could genuinely share maybe some of our hurts, our pains with some people in our life this week that you position as divine opportunities, that, Lord, we would share the gospel and our lives with them and that we would see them come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that we would walk in our primary purpose, which was yours, to seek and save that which is lost. Man, I commission you this week to go and make a difference in the lives of others in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. Would you put your hands together and give God some glory? Hey, I know we ran long, but if you need prayer, our prayer team is up here at the front. If you made a decision to surrender your life to Jesus today, please come up here to the front. Um, I know they would love to pray with you, talk with you, give you some next steps. If you're new to Journey and we haven't met, come on up and say hello. I'd love to meet you. God bless you guys. Have a great week.